So without further ado, let me introduce Tori Gage Tomlinson, who is our speaker for tonight. Um, Tori recently graduated from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and I believe he did his final work for Cal Poly in South America. He was a... Uh, he got his degree in biology. He spent nearly half a year studying, doing research in Ecuador uh, and ecology in Ecuador. He's been an avid birder from a young age, as you can tell by his world life list of over 2,400 species of birds. Um, for those of you that keep count, uh, that's a pretty remarkable list of birds. Uh, so Tori is... Uh, He's now a board member. He became a board member for More Coast Audubon because he started out as an intern that was sponsored by More Coast Audubon Society through the High Mountain Condor Lookout Project. And unfortunately, it was during the pandemic and the lookout was closed. But we realized that all of the condor records were being held by Jan Hamber, who is, I believe, in her 90s, out of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. So we hired Tori to take her records and digitize them. He spent... I don't know many how many hundreds of hours digitizing photos and other kinds of records. So that is all available now since it is in, in digital form. Um, but after that, he expressed a, an interest in becoming a board member for Mark Coast Audubon Society. And we took him on as a board member knowing that he was going to South America. And he has been a very faithful attendee at our board meetings via Zoom. I mean, the, the other benefit of Zoom. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of our newer board members, Tori Gage Tomlinson tonight. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Judy. Uh, let me share my screen here and I'll get confirmation from you that everyone can see that. That's good. Great. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I am Tori Gage Tomlinson, and that was a great introduction by Judy there. Uh, I recently graduated from Cal Poly, and I've been into birds for as long as I can remember. I can thank my dad for that. And I'm presenting tonight um, titles Exploring Biodiversity and Conservation in Ecuador, Ecologist Perspective. And it's just a some insights and takeaways and stories and uh, different facts from my time in Ecuador over the last, um, I spent about six months there. Um, anyways, so if you're familiar with Ecuador, you know that it is a fantastically diverse country. It's actually classified as a mega diverse country. There's 17 of those in the world and Ecuador is one of the most diverse of even those. Um, and that means it's got a very high number of endemic species and it exhibits great biodiversity. Um, one of the parameters is it has to have at least 5,000 species of, endem of endemic plants. And um, you can see that it has way more than that. It has about 20,000 plant species, 1,500 bird species, 840 species of reptiles and amphibians, and 341 species of mammal. And so that is way more than we have in the United States. It's way more than most countries in the world. Um, and it might be the most ecologically diverse country in the world for its size. Um, and one last cool fact about Ecuador is that it's the only country in the world that recognizes the rights of nature in its constitution, which is a bit ironic as uh, we will get to. Um, there we go. Uh, the Ecuadorian avifauna, um, <clears throat> Ecuador has 1,681 known species, and that includes all species that have ever been recorded there. So there's certainly a few in that total that are um, like we have in the United States that are vagrants, but there's about at least 1,500 breeding species um, and 42 breeding endemics so that it's, comes in as fifth in the world, which is pretty insane considering Ecuador is about the size of Colorado. Um, and it also has a very high number of vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered species, uh, 83, and uh, we'll get to why that's really important, but really remarkable amount of birds considering, again, the size of Colorado, it's about twice as many species as the continental United States, so pretty mind-boggling. Here's a nice little map, it's pretty old. Um, but it illustrates well the topography and the geography of Ecuador. So you can see left-hand side where uh, Ecuador is located. Let me pull up 
a laser pointer for you guys here and you can see it better. Um, you can see it's on the northwestern coast of South America there, right on the equator, which is where it gets its name, Ecuador, which is equator in Spanish. Um, and you can see it's bisected by the Andes here. Uh, it's pretty remarkable country um, because its highest point is 20,000 feet, more than 20,000 feet, Volcan Chimborazo, which is actually the closest point on Earth to the sun because of this thing called the equatorial bulge, which I'm not going to get into, but it's very interesting. You should look it up if uh, you have the time. And you can see it's bisected. So you have these western lowlands, which the northern part here is a lot of rainforest and it gets a lot drier down here. And then this whole part is the Amazon. And as you come up from the Amazon, you gain elevation, reach this ridge of the Andes, get up to about 20,000 feet, and then come back down to sea level all in the span of a uh, country the size of Colorado, which is pretty insane. And it harbors some pretty crazy biodiversity. One other thing that's important to know about Ecuador is the population center is almost all along the Andes here in these inter-Andean valleys. Then on the coast down here in Guayaquil, less than 1% of the population actually lives in the Amazon here, which is another important thing we'll get to later. Um, here's a map that I really like because it shows the absolute mega diversity that Ecuador has to offer. Um, these are actually, this is from a study in 2020, and these are actually just forest ecosystems that are outlined on this map. So each different color here is a different type of forest ecosystem. There's more than 45 of them here. And you can see how incredibly diverse this area is ecologically, and that's just forests. There's over a hundred unique ecoregions within this country. So it's really, really, really diverse, really incredible place to be just studying biology. But um, that diversity is in direct contradiction with the plethora of environmental issues that are um, that face Ecuador, it has the highest deforestation rate in the Western hemisphere. Um, it's got insane levels of oil exploitation, mining, logging, and development. That's led to an insane decrease in primary forest over the last century or so. Um, it only has about 15% of its original primary forest left. And if you don't know what primary forest is, primary forest is essentially forest that hasn't been logged in a long time or it's never been logged. So it's, a, it's something we often associate with the term old growth. Um, and so Ecuador has very little of its primary forest left. And a lot of that has to do with high levels of corruption in the government, which is unfortunate. Um, and a lot of neo-extractivist policies that are present in the government nowadays for a number of reasons, it's not at all entirely Ecuador's fault or anything like that. Um, but unfortunately the political climate in Ecuador has lent itself to having very little, very little value on the environment, despite having it being the only country in the world that includes its, the environment and its constitution. Um, so the program that I was fortunate enough to be a part of, um, it was kind of an addition onto my college because I graduated pretty recently, but I haven't actually attended class at Cal Poly since last summer. And so I was supposed to do this program when I was a junior in college, which is all the way back in 2020, 2021. And so this program got canceled several times, uh, but I always had it in the back of my mind that I knew I really wanted to do it. And I was fortunate enough to be able to add it on after I was done at Cal Poly. So it is a five month intensive field research program um, in Ecuador. And these are the three directors and they're all three experts in their field. They're all expert ecologists and know Ecuador like the back of their hands. Um, and so we would spend a lot of time in Quito, but then we would go weekly to do different um, study trips around the country. And uh, I'm gonna be going through some of the different ecosystems that we got to experience. Um, and they really adopted this mindset of studying Ecuador as the case study for environmental conservation. So this is kind of a little graphic that you can see the steps to that. So there's a lot of environmental issues in Ecuador, such as mining and oil extraction, as you can see in these two. 
there's also a high biodiversity, right? And so we can combine those two to look and see and use that for environmental study and understand not only how these ecosystems work and the ecology and biology of it, but how, what are the best methods of conservation and stuff like that. So this program really took this to heart um, and really prioritizes Ecuador as a global priority for study. So the first region um, we visited and it's fitting because this is actually the most affected region, the most affected ecosystem in Ecuador. Um, is Andean dry forest, less than 1% of it remains. And that's really because uh, it has the unfortunate uh, location of being in these Andean dry valleys. You can see here on this map, this dark brown that runs down. That's a, a gross misrepresentation of how much actually exists, but it kind of shows where these valleys are located. And so we visited the first week a place called Bosque Jerusalem, which is northeast of Quito, um, which is probably the best remaining area of Andean dry forest. And um, Andean dry forest is very unique floristically. All of these, except the lower left plant here, which is a species of agave, um, they're all endemic. And there's many, many, many endemic species. Um, it's really interesting because uh, you can see that this plant here is a bromeliad. We're not really that familiar with these, but these exist in temperate climates. They grow on things, epiphytes. Um, they're also known as epiphytes. And this whole place is littered with them. Even these cacti have bromeliads on them. So it's a really interesting uh, place floristically. And also the fauna is very interesting too. Um, the, you can see a familiar face for some of you probably, this vermilion flycatcher, which exists throughout the Americas. Um, very common there, along with this golden grosbeak and scrub tanager and this real bomba marsupial frog, which we were lucky enough to find, which has a range only within these inter-Andean valleys in Ecuador and Colombia. So this is a very endangered species. However, there's not very many um, species that uh, of fauna that exist uh, only in these areas. So it's really a priority for flora to protect. Um, and here's a good reason why not a lot of these valleys exist anymore is the city of Quito, which is exists within one singular inter-Andean valley that is 25 miles long and three miles wide. And it is a huge city. Um, Two million may not seem like all that much to us, but I can guarantee you it is enormous. Um, and you can see it's a concrete jungle. So there's really not a whole lot offered by Quito ecologically, but it's a good place to Face yourself, which is what I did. Um, here's the family. I was lucky enough to stay with the Castillo Ortiz family. Uh, the father, you can see here, we used to do some bike rides together. He worked at the main uh, soccer club in Quito. And so I was lucky enough to be able to go to a bunch of games and spend a bunch of time with my host brother and his girlfriend and my host sister. And this is up above Quito. You can see Quito in the background here, but it's a really cool place where you can hike up and there's your uh, stereotypical llamas at a uh, ranch outside Quito. Anyways, like I said, Quito has very little to offer ecologically. It's really interesting culturally. There's a lot of interesting stuff, but that's not what this presentation is about. So I'm gonna get to the Paramo, which is the first place we really visited. Um, we spent three days in the Paramo. There's a very unique ecosystem of South America and Northern South America and Southern Central America. Uh, it's a high elevation tundra-like ecosystem, very unique botanically. You can see these are actually bromeliads, which you usually think of growing on trees, but there are no trees. And so they've actually taken over a lot of this ecosystem um, with plants that look kind of like this. Um, it's really interesting because it's very wet, but it almost looks like Joshua tree out there. Um, and one really interesting part of this ecosystem are these tussock grasses that are formed. Um, there's these big hummocks of grass that look like some kind of Dr. Seuss landscape up there. And this is a close up. You can see it's actually made up of all these different little plants. And these are actually in the genus Plantago. If I have any plant nerds in the audience out there, they know what Plantago is. And you can, you know that these don't look anything like Plantago. So I found it very interesting that it looks so different from our Plantagos, which are usually roadside weeds that you, or weeds that you think of pulling out of your lawn. 
Um, anyways, those form these big tussocks that look just like this. And there's an Andean deer, which is the same species of mule deer that we have, except it's a different subspecies. And it's unlike our deers, which seem to be everywhere, at least where I am in Oregon, these guys are very uncommon. And they were almost hunted to extinction in Ecuador. And only local recent conservation efforts have resulted in a rebound of their population. And so we were lucky enough to see these guys, which uh, to our Ecuadorian professors were really exciting to us. We were like, well, it's another deer, but it's an interesting conservation story. As are these guys, which are spectacled bears, which I had no expectation of seeing coming to Ecuador. And we got so lucky to see this mother with her two cubs chowing down on these bromeliads, which you can see here. Very enigmatic animal of the paramo. Um, it's used as a flagship species for a lot of conservation efforts in South America. So really exciting that these guys are making a rebound. This is only about 80 miles from Quito, which is really exciting. There's been sightings much closer to Quito and they're actually making a really good rebound. So it's really exciting to see these guys doing well. Here's another strange little animal that is called a Gunther's world tail iguana, which we ran across just hanging out in some afternoon sun. Um, these guys are really strange animals, as are these um, Andean ibis, which hadn't been recorded in Ecuador for quite some time, and now are also making a comeback because of local conservation efforts in the Paramo. And this guy is the most, um, the, the largest flagship species for Ecuadorian conservation period, uh, the Andean condor. It's on the Ecuadorian flag. It's the Ecuadorian national animal. And ironically, there are not very many of them in Ecuador, only about a hundred. Um, and they're all centered around this area where we went called Volcan Antisana. Um, and that's a lot to do with major conflicts um, with ranchers because ranch, these guys feed on uh, dead animals and ranchers will actually poison them. So it's really important that these guys are preserved because it's a very important flagship species for conservation in Ecuador. And they have very low rates of, um, very low birth rates, very low rates of fertility. They only raise a chick every other year. And it's very hard if any of you are familiar with the California condor conservation program. Uh, that's, this guy is their most, um, most related uh, relative in the world. And so these guys also have very low rates of fertility. Um, and kind of ties into the threats uh, that are in the Paramo. A huge threat to the Paramo, not only to the Paramo, but everywhere in Ecuador is agrarian reform. And if you're not uh, familiar with that term, agrarian reform was a movement in the late 1980s, 1970s, late 1900s. Um, and it basically was this movement that was promoted by a lot of politicians in South America, a lot of whom were supported by the United States that resulted in the destruction of so much habitat and so much environment in South America that really it, it came from this idea of any land that is not being used for agriculture, mining, uh, oil, different stuff like that, that can boost the economy is basically a waste of land use. And so a lot of South America is still recovering from that, those policies that were implemented in the late 1900s. Um, so that is a huge factor regarding threats to the Paramo. Another huge factor is climate change. Uh, perhaps more than any, any ecosystem in South America, the Paramo is affected by climate change because it's the highest altitude of any ecosystems save for mountaintops in South America. And so we're seeing this thing called altitudinal rain shift, range shift, where forests are creeping up in elevation and glaciers are retreating. And so the Paramo is moving up in elevation, which kind of has this effect on species that live there, a uh, phenological shift, uh, which is basically to say, that stuff is happening earlier in the year and these species haven't evolved for that. And so there's all sorts of problems that come from that. One saving grace is that most water in Colombia and Ecuador, which have a lot of Paramo, uh, comes from these Paramo ecosystems. Um, and so there's a big push to save it beyond um, just a, a 
there, there's a big push from that being where drinking water comes from, right? So it's not just the idea that we're saving it for all the ecosystems and everything. We're actually saving it for drinking water. So that is kind of a roundabout way of saying that it's more, there's more value to that, which is somewhat ironic. Um, so one thing I'll do is highlight these individual uh, success stories that I found while I was there that we were introduced to. And one is um, this Reserva Chacana, which is managed by this foundation called Fundacion Hokotoko, which is named after a bird called Hokotoko ant pitta, if any of you heard of it. It's a huge species of ant pitta, which is a really cool um, genus of birds that lives in South America that was recently discovered in Southern Ecuador. And so there's this foundation named after them and they're devoted to saving Ecuadorian uh, ecosystems in different places where there's a lot of endangered species. So this Reserva Chacana is the largest sanctuary in Ecuador for Andean condors, spectacled bear and Andean deer. And so it's very, very integral to uh, the success of these, these species that places like this be saved. Um, and this lodge here is another success story called Tambo Condor. The owner of this we talked to for quite a while. Um, and you can see these cliffs behind Tambo Condors where a lot, um, based on our, on our observations, one quarter of all the Andean and condors in Ecuador live. Um, we saw 25 different Indian condors soaring above this lodge. It's a really fantastic place. Um, and I cannot re recommend going there enough. The next ecosystem that we visited uh, is the Indian cloud forest. And this is really what you think of when you think of Ecuador. This uh, harbors a lot of species of very, very, very cool birds, tanagers and hummingbirds being the two most diverse groups there. Um, and you can see where it's located. It's along the Andes here, and it's elevations of about 1,000 meters, so about 3,000 feet all the way up to uh, tree level, or sorry, um, tree line. And so you can see that it's a pretty broad ecosystem that extends along the Andes and even up into um, Central America here. And it's really uh, characteristics of this ecosystem are these clouds that come up through the forest, so there's a lot of moisture in the air. Um, so that results in very heavy rainfall, which is some of the highest rainfall anywhere in the world, as you can see right here, which is these rainfall rates are absolutely crazy. Um, and these are some of the most biodiverse spots in all of the world along the Andes. This gradient as you're coming up from the Amazon into the Andes is absolutely incredible diversity. Um, and so you have a huge elevational gradient going from about 300 feet all the way up to about 20, no, well, I guess tree line is probably around um, 11,000 feet in this area. And so you have a huge geographical gradient and you have a lot of geographical isolation because these mountain ranges are just pockmarked with all these different little ridges and stuff like that. And a lot of species just get stuck in one little valley and then never go over to the next valley. So you see insane levels of speciation along these gradients on both slopes of the Andes here, especially in Ecuador. Um, and that results in huge levels of primary productivity, meaning there's so many plants and so many primary producers in these areas that there is just so much biomass and so much food for animals that they just thrive. Um, and that is very evident with all of these different species of um, orchids that exist on the eastern slope of the Andes in Ecuador, which we were lucky enough to do a little studying of. Um, these, this is just a one example of all these different species of orchid, but there's about 300 different species, which is a um, huge diversity of orchids along the eastern slope of the Andes. Um, and that has directly resulted in a huge diversity of hummingbirds. Um, this highest concentration of orchids in the world has resulted in all these hummingbirds co-evolving, meaning that this bird right here, a sword-billed hummingbird, which is the only bird in the entire world that has a beak longer than its body, um, seeing this thing fly is absolutely mind-boggling. It, it's really, really a bizarre creature and really amazing to behold, but it is directly 
evolved with one species of flower or one one group of flowers that has a very long tube um which is why it needs this humongous bill and frankly somewhat ridiculous looking bill to get access to the nectar and so you see that with all sorts of hummingbirds that being one of the most um extreme examples but there's 132 species of hummingbirds in ecuador compared to our 15 that are in the entire United States. And for the majority of the United States, there's really only one or two species. So it's really something insane that there's 132 species of hummingbird in a country the size of Colorado. And most of them are concentrated in the cloud forest. Uh, like I said, it has a lot to do with co-evolution between them and different types of flowers. And one unique uh, phenomena in Ecuador is that it's a huge ecotourism attraction. Right, you see feeders that look like this, or even crazier than this, where you have here we only have three species of hummingbird, but I've seen photos and uh, I've seen it personally on hummingbird feeders where you have 10 or 15 different species of hummingbird on one feeder, and you have different feeders that have can support up to 30 different species of hummingbird in Ecuador. And so it's really in interesting to see how much. Um, ecotourism this attracts. I mean, there are places in Ecuador that are solely devoted for people coming to look at the hummingbirds there. This is really interesting because it's supporting conservation in these areas. And it's a really valuable tool and a really thing, really valuable thing we can emulate in different, um, different ecosystems that have this incredible diversity of birds. Um, and so I'll just go through a few photos. This is a purple bibbed white tip, really spunky little hummingbird um, that it's a little shy, actually. Uh, this is a buff-tailed coronet with his tongue sticking all the way out. An Andean emerald and a crowned wood nymph. And this guy is actually away from a feeder, so it's kind of nice. Uh, these other guys, they're kind of perched near feeders, so it's easy to take photos of them. But this guy stumbled upon in the middle of a rainstorm out in the rainforest, and he was just hanging out on this branch. Um, and it, feeders also attract birds that are not um, hummingbirds like this plate-billed mountain toucan, which is one of the most enigmatic birds of the tropical Andes in Ecuador. It was the number one bird on my target list uh, for Ecuador, and I was lucky enough to get a glimpse of this guy. He came in and he was eating at a banana feeder, which um, was just in the back of someone's house, and they had set up this entire little business showing people this bird that would come in and eat bananas out of the back of their house. And so it was really interesting to see how that is supporting conservation. Um, other birds like these blue winged mountain tanagers are just very flag flagship species for conservation in the region. This barrel spangled tanager, really beautiful flame faced tanager, aptly named. Um, this hooded mountain tanager, which is a really cool bird. It's about the size of a robin, um, and it's the largest tanager I've ever seen. Really interesting bird. And then another bird, if anyone's been in South or Central America, you're probably familiar with is colored forest falcon. Uh, what was really interesting about this bird is that we were at a place called Santa Lucia Cloud Forest, which I will get to in a second. Um, but this bird was frequenting the grounds there and we heard it and heard it and heard it. They have a really distinctive call that almost sounds like a human yelling. Um, and we were hearing it and finally saw it. And I'd never seen a collared forest falcon that looks like this. This is a dark morph collared forest falcon, um, which now I know represents about less than 1% of the population. I'd seen about 40 light morph or buffy morph ones, but I'd never seen a dark morph. So this was fascinating to see. Um, anyways, let's get to threats to the cloud forest. Um, a huge threat is mining uh, in the tropical Andes. There's a lot of copper and gold and silver mines throughout the cloud forest because this region has a lot of activity, um, geolo ge geological activity. And so there's a lot of precious metals in this area. And so unfortunately, there's a lot of habitat degradation due to mining and deforestation, which is a result of mining. Um, but a recent vote actually banned mining throughout much of the Western Andes in Ecuador, which was a huge landslide decision. It actually passed an Ecuadorian popular vote at about 62%, which is a huge margin. Um, and so hopefully we will see a decline in mining throughout the Western Andes in Ecuador. Um, but 
it's hard to have a whole lot of faith because the enforcement levels historically have not been too great. So we'll monitor that situation. Um, but one interesting example that I was able to see when I was in Ecuador was this place, Santa Lucia Cloud Forest, which we visited. There's this beautiful lodge on top of this mountain. You actually have to hike about two miles up the side of a mountain to get there. But once you get there, it's this great research station um, and it's community owned which is really interesting. A lot of places in Ecuador that do conservation are owned by international organizations, but this is actually a community owned protected forest, which is funded by research grants from elsewhere. And there's also, it's funded by an Ecuadorian government program called Socio Bosque. Um, and it's a really fascinating place uh, because what they do is they do a bunch of environmental education for locals, um, a lot of research opportunities for locals and a lot of community involvement in trail building. It's completely staffed by locals. Um, and a lot of the research is done by people who actually live there. So it's a really interesting place. We were able to spend a week here and participate in some of the research they were doing and help out um, doing some bird mist netting and banding, which was really awesome because uh, we got to hold stuff like this in our hands, crimson rump toucanet. And I've never seen a bird more upset in a mist net than this thing. It was snapping at everybody and making some horrific noises. But once we got them settled down, it was really cool to take some really up close looks at birds that you really only ever see from pretty far away. Um, there's me holding a bronzy Inca and our program director, Javier Silva, holding this really greatly named Flavescent Flycatcher, which is somewhat drab compared to its name. Um, and then there's a lot of research done there that doesn't have to do anything with birds too. Uh, so they have a really great trail um, cam, camera trap system set up throughout their trails on um, 730 hectares. And so one interesting thing that we noticed when we were there is we, that we were going through some camera trap data and we were seeing a lot of photos of this mountain lion here. And we showed it to the main researcher in charge there. And he said that what this mountain lion does is it actually stalks people. So you'll get a photo of people walking past a trail cam. And then two minutes later, you'll see this mountain lion or puma as it's uh, most commonly called in South America that tracks pe or stalks people. And he said he's walked that trail thousands of times and he's never actually seen this animal, but he's seen it, he's seen it on trail cam stalk him uh, a handful of times. So kind of interesting. Uh, it's also a great sanctuary for these spectacled bears. These are some really cute cubs, um, but you don't want to come in between them and their mother. Anyways, uh, very, very diverse in terms of insects as well. Um, you can see how diverse, like a bunch of different species of moth just on one panel. This is, this is actually a moth too that is emulating a bee. And then this guy, we like to say, puts the mega in diversity, this rhinoceros beetle, this huge thing um, that was probably the largest insect I've ever seen. Anyways, moving on, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the Ecuadorian Amazon a little bit, which is uh, as fascinating as the cloud forest is, the Ecuadorian Amazon is the most, one of, one of well, probably the most fascinating ecosystem Ecuador. Um, you can see it's all of this eastern part of Ecuador and it extends up into the mountains just a little bit. And the main river that uh, constitutes the Ecuadorian Amazon is the Napo River. Some of you have maybe been there. It runs from right about here down and it's one of the main three tributaries of the Amazon River. Um, this is a pretty typical view from the banks of the Napo River. Um, so the Ecuadorian Amazon is the most biodiverse region in Ecuador, which is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. So it holds that it is one of, if not the most biodiverse regions in the world. Um, here's some stats to just really jump off the page at you. 70,000 species of insect per acre, per acre. That is mind boggling. 800 species of fish, 300 species of reptile and 300 species of mammal. Um, and you can see these are all my photos here, some really cool uh, critters that live there. It's some blue and yellow macaws, this 88 butterfly, which is very, let's see if I can zoom in on that guy here. You can see it actually does say 88 right on his wings there. Um, these dusky TD monkeys and this assassin bug, 
really so just some of the really cool uh animals that i was able to see there um not to mention it being the most diverse place for trees on planet earth that's 650 species per hectare 1100 species per 25 hectares one hectare is about 2.5 acres so that is an insane that's i mean that's more than most places have period so that's per hectare that's absolutely mind-boggling and these maps kind of just um show you all of that just kind of put into a map so you can see these areas of high diversity for amphibians birds plants mammals and they all converge right in the ecuadorian amazon um, there's a lot of theories about why that is the leading one is that this is the oldest region of the amazon and so it's actually had the most time to form all these different species and it also receives some of the highest rainfall of anywhere in the amazon so it is just I mean, it is firing on all cylinders. Not to mention birds. Uh, there's about 1,100 species of birds just in the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, which is crazy considering it's about half of a country that's the size of Colorado. Um, and it's the least known of any terrestrial ecosystem in Ecuador. That's not to say that there's the least amount of research being done there, but there's just so much diversity there and so much biomass that it's very difficult to know to know much about it. Um, interestingly, it doesn't have very high levels of endemism, but it has huge levels of diversity. And it's important for a lot of birds that come down from North America during the winter months. A lot of warblers that hang out in the Amazon. Um, and it's very strange as well. You get these really interesting animals, such as this bird on the right, uh, known locally as a stinky chicken, or sorry, stinky turkey, um, called a Hawatson. And it's essentially a flying cow it only eats um it's it's essentially a ruminant it only eats uh vegetation it has more than a thousand different species of bacteria found in its crop it's a very strange animal and it's called a stinky turkey because of how bad it smells because of all the digesting of plant matter it's doing and i'll leave your imagination up to why that is anyways um Here's another very enigmatic species uh, and a pretty special bird to me too. It's called a crested eagle. Uh, it's an incredibly rare raptor throughout the Americas. It has a very wide range, but its highest um, concentration is actually in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And uh, we were lucky enough to see this bird. It was about a mile away and then it started flying towards us and flew right over a troop of howler monkeys who just started going ballistic because that is its main prey. And why it's so special to me is because it was actually my 2000th life bird, which was incredibly fortunate. I had no idea that it was going to be my 2000th bird. Um, so that's pretty special to me. Um, and it was an act absolutely incredible experience. And these birds like the Hawatson and that crest eagle play right into ecotourism. You can see this Amazonian pink river dolphin, which we didn't actually get to see, but you can definitely see it on the Napo River <clears throat> in Ecuador. Um, and it, they play right into ecotourism because there's such a diversity and splendor of fauna and flora in this region that it just, I mean, it's people will pay a lot of money to see it. And it's really important that people are coming there because it provides a huge boost to local communities, to conservation efforts, to all sorts of things that benefit um, tourists and people living in this area as well. So you can kind of see this model of sustainable ecotourism and scientific research. As we do that, it provides revenue for local communities and kind of re, um, cements, re cements this idea that conservation of fauna and flora is really important. Um, here's another specific example of that in Ecuador is this organization called Sumac Alba, um, which is uh, mostly active in the Amazonian region in Ecuador, and it's a primate sanctuary. Um, they do a lot of primate sanctuary and research on this one island in the Napa River. It protects and rehabilitates primates on that island. They have nine species of primates, including this guy, which I'll zoom in on, the pygmy marmoset, which I got, I was lucky enough to get a nice little photo of this cute guy, is the smallest primate in the world, um, and quite possibly the cutest. Uh, so this guy and along with eight other different species of primates live on that island. There's about 
uh, 21 different species of primates in Ecuador. And this is actually the largest sanctuary for them in Ecuador. Another thing they do is bicultural and bilingual elementary schools. They've implemented all these bicultural and bilingual elementary schools in the region, which you might think, well, it's good that they're teaching Spanish and English, but they're not. They're teaching Spanish and Quechua, which is the local la native language of a lot of this region. Is Quechua, so it's reintroducing a lot of bio of um, cultural and linguistic elements to these kids who have largely lost a lot of it through the um, introduction of a lot of uh, different ideas through habitat degradation and oil exploitation in this region. And so they do a lot of bicultural and bilingual elementary education, as well as environmental education for people who live there, as well as people who are visiting there. So it's a really awesome organization. Um, and it's one of several that really does a lot of work that's similar to that in the region. And they've been trying to combat a lot of these environmental threats uh, to the Ecuadorian Amazon, which is one of the most threatened eco regions in Ecuador. So the big one, which a lot of you have probably heard of is oil exploitation. Um, Ecuador actually, the Amazonian region of Ecuador sits upon the largest reserves of oil in South America, including in Venezuela. So they have, um, they're essentially sitting on this gold mine. And uh, so they've started exploiting a lot of it, which is bad news for a lot of the uh, biodiversity and ecology in the region. Um, and the method in which that oil has been exploited is terrible. Um, Texaco is actually the first company to exploit the oil in that region, which is largely encompassed by a, a park called Yasuni National Park, which has made a lot of headlines lately. Um, and it's a horrific environmental and humanitarian crisis. Uh, and it's uh, actually much worse than what how it appears, which is already terrible. Um, there's huge levels of health issues around oil contamination of drinking water in the area, um, huge, huge levels of biodiversity loss. So it's really a travesty um, in this region. But there was recently a uh, vote actually to, well, I'll get into it, but there's a vote recently to stop oil um, exploitation in this region and it actually passed. So it's some hope. Um, but oil exploitation is kind of merging into this exploitation of palm oil plantations, which is equally, if not worse, of a threat in the future. It's caused 30% deforestation since the 1970s, and palm oil is used as um, an ingredient on a lot of uh, a lot of food, a lot of processed food. So if you go and you look at your Oreo, is probably the first ingredient or second ingredient you'll see is palm oil. Um, and so palm oil has just caused a lot of problems. One of the huge problems that it's causing is actually um, when you deforest a, all this area that used to have forests, it releases a lot of naturally occurring mercury into water, which has resulted in a lot of mercury poisoning for fish in the region and making these huge fishery regions along the Napo River and the Amazon River basically um, unfishable. So it's really sad. And then mining, of course, which is kind of ever present. There's a lot of gold mining in this region as you get up into higher elevations. And so those are the three main environmental threats of that region in the Amazon. Um, so it's had a lot of impact on the local communities in Ecuador, um, especially in Yasuni National Park, which is home to the Tagayeri and the Taro Manane peoples who are part of this larger Waurani culture that lives in this region. And they're actually two groups of people that are in voluntary isolation from the outside world. And so there has been a push recently to basically stop oil exploitation in this area um, so that these people will be protected from outside influence. Uh, but as you can see on this map, it's a lot of different stuff going on in this map. But essentially, these brown areas are different areas of oil exploitation. And so you can see in this what's called the zona intangible, which means intangible zone, which is this checked yellow area, there are some illegal mining operations here and the Ecuadorian government has done very little about it. And so despite a recent vote to stop all this oil mining, um, we continue to see 
all of this exploitation of oil in this region, which is really unfortunate. Um, and so there is hope though. So there was a recent referendum only about, uh, gosh, maybe about three weeks ago that Ecuadorians voted to stop oil drilling in the Amazon, which is really, uh, really great for the Amazon. Um, actually passed with 59% of the vote, so carried by quite a bit. Um, but that's largely a, res a response to this large push from indigenous voters and activists that traveled all around the country pushing this referendum, you know, basically explaining why it would be so bad to continue oil drilling in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and this quote from the former president of Ecuador, who's, um, well, I guess he still is until the elections. Uh, he said, now that the global trend is to abandon fossil fuels, the time has come to extract every last drop of benefit from our oil so that I can serve the poorest while respecting the environment. Well, that is just such an ironic quote. Uh, and that just gives you an idea of the political power and the political force that a lot of these um, conservationist movements and environmentalist movements are going up against, right? He is the president of Ecuador essentially saying that it's our highest priority to extract every last drop of benefit from our oil. So it's really hard. Um, it's tough sledding in Latin America doing conservation work and it you know, it remains to be seen how this vote will be executed, how the Amazon will really be protected. Um, Ecuador's main export is oil. The country already st is struggling financially, so it's it's difficult to wean off of oil for Ecuador. The last ecosystem I'll be talking about is the Ecuadorian Choco, um, which was where I was lucky enough to do some research, and I uh, stayed there for a month and a half, right on the border of the Andean the tropical Andes, which is the cloud forest in the Choco. Um, and the Choco is this region in northwestern Ecuador, you can kind of see where my laser is pointing here, which is tropical rainforest that runs all the way from up here, which is Panama, down the western coast of Colombia and up into northwestern Ecuador. And the Choco is actually the most threatened region in Ecuador, about um, only about 10% of it remains, about 90% of it has been deforested recently. Um, but it's a really interesting region. It has all these interesting birds, like this long waddled umbrella bird, which is another mind boggling bird, it has this insanely long waddle that comes down from its neck. Um, and it has some of the highest levels of endemism in any Ecuadorian ecoregion. So uh, it's a really interesting place to be sitting because it has some of the highest threats, but it's also one of the most biodiverse and highest levels of endemism. Some of the environmental issues here is it has the highest deforestation rate, rate in all of the Western hemisphere, this area. So you can see on this map, it's a little hard to read, but essentially these lines represent what used to be the Choco. And now you can kind of see there's very little of it left. Um, there's oil exploitation, mining, logging, and development, uh, like all of the other regions in Ecuador. So a lot of threats. Um, and that has resulted to less than 15% of primary forest left. Um, yeah, and so a lot of the neo-extractivist policies that I was talking about earlier um, and high levels of corruption in the government just have resulted in this eco-region being completely decimated. But there are some um, saving graces. There are some lights at the end of the tunnel. And one is this found Fundacion Ecominga, which Ecominga uh, means echo, which is eco, and Minga, which is a Quechua word for a, basically a community meeting. So this means community meeting for the environment. Really elegantly named organization that also does a lot of really great work in Ecuador. Um, they identify and protect areas of very high biodiversity and endemism in Ecuador. They have, I think they're going, I think they have 16 different reserves now. And one of their main um, things is that they work with local communities and international organizations to raise awareness of the value of Ecuador's environment. Um, a lot of that work is with local communities, which was something I got to do while I was living and doing research there. Um, so where I did research was in the Northwest of Ecuador here, right on the border between the tropical Andes, you can see in the pink uh, salmon kind of color and the green uh, choco 
bioregion color right on this border in this middle of this red box there. So I was in between 900 and 1800 meters. So you can see tropical Andes, 1000 meters tree line, Choco sea level to 1000 meters. And there's extremely high levels of avian diversity where they intersect. Um, it actually constitutes about 25% of all the world's birds species live in these two ecoregions, which is pretty mind boggling, considering that it's less than 1% of Earth's surface area. And about 27% of all those birds are endemic to these two ecoregions. So tropical Andes extends a lot, but this Choco region, very diverse and pretty small. So that is pretty crazy, which makes it a very good spot to do research combined with the fact that there's very little research done there. So there's a lot of new research to do. And what we were doing was doing research for Fundacion Ecominga, that uh, NGO I was talking about just a second ago. And we did an investigation of IUCN listed species in this region right here, which is the Choco Andean, Choco Tropical Andean uh, Corridor is what it's called. And uh, the idea is that if you find a lot of IUCN listed species in this area, uh, it can lead to a lot of grant money because IUCN is a huge international organization. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with it. They have a uh, list called the IUCN Red List that lists all of these species that are in danger of extinction and vulnerable and threatened and at least concern and near threatened. And there's all these different designations. So what we were doing was searching this area, which is called the Rio Manduriaco Reserve, which is right in this northwestern part of Ecuador. That's a zoomed in map of where we were doing research. Um, we're searching this whole area, doing transect surveys to detect IUCN listed birds, of which there are quite a few. Um, and it's really high importance because this is Choco, primary Choco forest, which does not exist very much. There's not much of it anymore. So any kind of conservation efforts to preserve this forest are very valuable. And so, um, so quick going over our results here, uh, you can see that we, this is in about a month of research, we found, we ended up having about 200, uh, 230 species, 250 species on the entire reserve, 20 set, um, sorry, 28 of which were in, in endangered, vulnerable or near threatened species. And so um, here's a graph of each one of those species. So you can see the high levels of different um, near threatened and endangered species we found. And you can see this graph kind of uh, shows nicely where we found each of those. And so secondary forest is forest that was logged and then um, basically was turned back into, is in the process of regenerating towards primary forest. And then primary forest is forest that hasn't been logged in a very long time or has never been logged. So you can see a whole lot of green on this graph. Um, really only two spots where there's any sort of yellow, which is where pasture land, which is essentially land that's pasture or has been cleared for urban development or anything like that, mining, stuff like that. So you can see that these IUCN listed species really prefer primary and secondary forest. And that's a very high importance to these species. So it kind of um, highlights how important it is that we protect these areas, especially in the Choco, where there's so many endangered and threatened species. Um, so it's really interesting to be on the ground and see that firsthand, where you always hear how, of how much importance primary forest and old growth forest are to species. But really being on the ground was really interesting to see that. And really interesting to see how unvaluable uh, pasture and disturbed land were to species. There was only two endangered and or threatened species that we encountered on any sort of disturbed land. Um, they pretty much only stuck to forest. Um, and one really interesting observation we had was of Choco Virio. It was only discovered in 1996 in Colombia. This is only the fourth known site for this bird in Ecuador. And we had several that were on breeding territory, which is really interesting. It's never been discovered in the province we were in. It's never been discovered in the area we were in. So it was very interesting to find that. Um, so how does it help conservation in this area? Well, the idea is that by going and doing research in these areas, uh, you will get the community more involved 
in the research effort. The community there is actually very receptive to research, very receptive to conservation. They're very interested in doing conservation work. And so it's really, research is a great way to provide an avenue of um, conservation for them and money, you know, revenue for them. Um, as is ecotourism. So they're starting to do, this is a very remote community at the end. Here's a photo of it. Um, essentially just this area um, is the community of about 40 people who live there at the end of this road in Northwest Ecuador, very remote. And they're really interested in doing ecotourism and starting, they have this reserve near them. Um, and so they're very interested in, in uh, starting to do ecotourism, starting to do research in this area. So it's really, it'd be interesting to go back and do a case study of how that can be used as a model for other communities in the area, how they can conserve their, um, the environment around them and what are the implications, you know, of doing that. Um, so really, you know, it's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's all these threats and everything, but it's really interesting to see how research and ecotourism can result in an increase in revenue for local communities and great opportunities for students from Ecuador and other areas like the US, like me and stuff like that. Anyways, I wanted to say thank you. Um, just an acknowledgement of Oliver Patrick, who I did most of my research with. I don't know if he made it today or not. He's on the East Coast, so it might be pretty late for him. Um, and then two of the um, guides we had there who kind of showed us how to get through. We, we basically had to build all of our own trails to do all this research. And they really helped us, Jimmy Alvarez and Dario Armas um, from Via Flora, which is the community we lived in and just wanted to thank the entire community there for welcoming us and having us. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about some of the big picture insights and takeaways that I had from spending so much time doing conservation and research in Ecuador and traveling to all these different places. Um, first of which is indigenous and local community rights. Um, I, I think that in the political climate we exist in, in the United States, it's sometimes easy to get, um, get away from these local and indigenous community rights, um, which has been a movement that we've been moving back towards lately, which is very fortunate. But in a place like Ecuador, where indigenous and local rights are very, very valued and very often intertwined with the na nature and the environment. Um, it's really fascinating to see how an indigenous activism and local community activism often have strong connections to the land and they play a really crucial role in conservation efforts in Ecuador. Um, and what, you know, moving forward, it's how we can use that as a model for our own conservation in uh, the United States and other places for um, respecting and integrating their values into conservation strategies. So it's really interesting how that um, has taken place in Ecuador. Uh, another takeaway is how, how does sustainable tourism fit into conservation in Ecuador? Um, Ecuador is one of the most naturally beautiful countries in the world. It, it's wildlife attracts so many tourists. And so, integrating sustainable tourism into conservation efforts in Ecuador and minimizing negative impacts of tourism um, is a really interesting area for study moving forward. Um, and are these success stories that I've outlined sustainable across Ecuador and the rest of the world? I think so. I think that they there's a lot of, um, you know, involving indigenous and local community rights, They're really important. Um, and a lot of these organizations and uh, success stories that I've outlined throughout this presentation do that. Um, and I think they are sustainable across Ecuador. You know, I think a lot of them probably need to be tweaked, uh, you know, concerning where they're taking place. But I think they are sustainable across Ecuador and the rest of the world. And how do we minimize our impact and support conservation abroad, right? As people living in the United States, how do we support conservation in places like Ecuador? And one of the most common answers I had to that question when I would ask it of people who were on the ground doing conservation research in Ecuador was funding. We think that conservation organizations in the United States are underfunded. Well, try going to South America because there are some heroes there. 
doing incredible work um, and receiving very little funding. And so what they said is that the most help you could possibly give to them is to donate to organizations like some of the ones I've outlined. Feel free to contact me and I can get you in touch with people who um, you know, know more about it than I do. But basically, most of these organizations are run by people who are making very little money and have a strong passion for protecting the environment. Um, and another thing we can do is raise awareness, right? You may think posting on your social media doesn't really do a lot, but you know, the more awareness there is, the more funding you can raise for these organizations that save the environment and uh, really have a strong mindset towards conservation. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for your attention. Um, and I'll answer any questions that you might want to put in the chat now. And Judy can ask them to me. All right. So, Tori, thank you so much. This was an, quite an incredible uh, program this evening. I was in the Amazon in the 1970s. And so seeing some of these changes is a little on the heartbreaking side. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So um, my question, I couldn't chat to, I couldn't chat to myself. So I'm going to ask it first. The sword-billed hummingbird. How in the world does that bird preen its feathers? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Its you see it sitting there and I had the same exact question. It actually does most of its preening with its feet. So it'll just sit yeah. on a branch yeah. and use yeah. its feet to preen its feathers. It's kind of fascinating to why it's it's an absolute spectacle. If anybody has the chance to see that bird, um, it's mind boggling. It really is. Um, yeah, so mostly it does its printing with its feet. <laughs> Very cool. Well, the next two are mostly comments. I, there's a comment from Marcel Bakula saying, very cool photos, Tori, wonderful presentation. What a great experience for you. And thank you for taking us all along. That was wonderful. Great. Yeah, of and course. Yeah, Sharon Blakely, you know, says much, uh, whoops, Let's see if I can get down there. Great presentation, Ecuador is a jewel. Thank you for taking us across the east side of the Andes and the Amazon as she'd only ever been in Quito and, and the Galapagos. Yeah. Um, I I mean, the, the, the thing we, you made reference to at one point was that, you know, South America is where birds go on migration too. Yes, so, yeah. So by by funding and helping the preservation in Ecuador and other places in South America, we're not only protect, protecting the endemic species to there, but we're also protecting species that we think of as our species because they they migrate back north and some of their nest or pass. Exactly. Through. Yeah, and um, an interesting thing is that a lot of these North American migrants that go to the Amazon, that go to South and Central America, we know very little about where they go or their migration patterns and stuff like that. So a lot of research lately through eBird and through um, citizen science has actually shed some light on their habits. And a lot of these areas that they're going, like it's a trend that a lot of North American migrants will go to one area, right? So like Kirtland's warbler all go to one spot, right? And so you bulldoze that spot and create a nice new resort for people to go to suddenly half the population of Kirtland's warbler is just gone, right? So it's really interesting to see how conservation impacts in South America and can affect, you know, the birds we know and love in North America. That's right. That's right. I don't know if there's any more, but I actually have two questions that were directly messaged to me. One from Alex Fairfield. Here it goes. Uh, 30 years ago, the National Institutes of Health and several universities launched a program to examine indigenous plants in the Amazon basin to look for new leads for medicines. The purpose including training local populations in natural product chemistry and botanical preservation, conserving areas where plants and medical benefits grew. Did you hear of any such program going on during your stay in Ecuador? Um, I did not actually, I didn't hear of anything related to the National Institutes of Health, but certainly, um, especially in the Amazonian region, the um, ethnobotanical uses they have for plants is absolutely fascinating um the guy we spent a lot of time with who was a local uh Kichua, he's actually runs that organization sumacalpa um his name's hector vargas and he knew more about ethnobotany than i've anyone i've ever met and he it was absolutely incredible seeing the different uses he had for plants he 
had this entire garden of native plants that he would use. And he said that he got COVID and he just used a complete, um, you know, completely used uh, the plants he had in his garden to treat the, the COVID he had. And he said it, you know, he was hardly affected by it. Um, he also said he was spouting off all these different uses of plants. He had ayahuasca in his garden. He had all sorts of different things. And it was absolutely, um, absolutely incredible to see the diversity of knowledge and of plants in that region. And then I have one more question from Jim Royer. Ecotourism has a large carbon footprint for foreign travelers. What is being done to address this contribution to climate change? Um, well, I would say certainly ecotourism, you know, certainly does have a large carbon footprint for foreign travelers. And it's an interesting light to see that in, right? You know, you don't often, you don't always think about what your, you know, you can think of, well, I'm supporting these communities by coming in and giving my, um, tourism to these communities, but I, you don't necessarily think always of um, the carbon footprint you're um, contributing to that. So one thing I know that Jim actually told me about <laughs> is uh, that there is a company where you can offset your emissions. And I would say contact him to because I don't know about that company. Um, but one thing that was we had many lectures on while I was there from Javier uh, Silva was the this idea of companies in uh, a lot of companies that we know of in the United States that call themselves carbon neutral. Um, and it can often be a pretty problematic label uh, to call yourself carbon neutral because a lot of these companies actually buy carbon offsets. And a lot of these offsets are run by other for-profit companies who go and they say, well, we replanted, you know, 100 hectares of plants, but then you go and look at what they actually did. And it was completely in complete disregard of any kind of um, ecology expertise, right? Nobody, there was nobody who was actually on that in, in making these decisions that would go and... Um, you know, say, well, this is, these are the best plants we can put into this ecosystem so that they're, uh, you know, producing on a primary level, on a secondary level, on all sorts of different levels. And so it's very, um, that can be a problematic label. And so if anyone's interested, you can contact me further and I can supply you with a really interesting article about that. Um, so yeah, just to, to wrap it up, I think ecotourism, you know, it's very, very important for people to to know you know what kind of carbon footprint they're having when they're traveling what kind of carbon footprint you're having when you're going day to day right you know it's not just when you're traveling it's when you're doing all sorts of things you know going to work or doing your day-to-day -day stuff I mean, how can you reduce your carbon footprint so it's really really a fascinating issue um, then I have a question from my dad, Boris Tomlinson. Are these reserves popular among Ecuadorians? Um, yes, they are. Uh, most of these reserves actually don't have anything to do with people who aren't Ecuadorian. I mean, a lot of the visitors are people who come from elsewhere, which if your question is, um, the visitors are mostly not Ecuadorian. But most of these places are like a couple dollars for Ecuadorians and then like $15 for anybody who's not Ecuadorian. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a incentive, an incentive for people who are Ecuadorian to come and visit these preserves, which really can get you excited about preservation. Um, one thing I noticed is that I think there's a lot less uh, awareness of conservation efforts, efforts from most of the people I talked to who were mostly in Quito. So a lot of people who lived in Quito didn't really know a lot about a lot of these reserves. So I would tell them and they'd be like, oh, well, I'm gonna go next week and visit, right? So it's really, that's another aspect of like getting the word out um, is once people start visiting these places, uh, you know, it can really increase conservation efforts in the region. Um, and so, yeah, I would say they are popular among the Ecuadorians who know them, but it's not necessarily as known as they could be. Um, and I think that is I have a, I have a couple more questions that came in Great. through Bob Revel. Um, the the politics seem to prevail in most countries. Um, 
Do the heads of the Ecuadorian country really appreciate the potential of ecotourism? Did you get that sense? Um, no, I, I did not get that sense at all. Uh, it's very, very hard to get much done from a conservation perspective in Ecuador and a lot of South America because you kind of see this effect of it's hard to really care a whole lot about protecting the environment when it, you know, your livelihood depends on, you know, agriculture or something like that, where it's kind of in direct contradiction with the environment. So I think a lot of the sense is if it's convenient to care about the environment, then, you know, then that's fine. But it's not necessarily a priority among Ecuadorian, in, in the Ecuadorian government. There was a recent president of Ecuador named Rafael Correa, who is a very divisive figure in Ecuador. Um, people who, it's, it's similar to Trump, people who love him, love him, and people who hate him, hate him. And he was, but he had very different politics from Trump, but a very um, similar divisive figure. And so he took he was um, president from 2008 to 2018, and he introduced this plan, which I didn't quite have time to go over, but I can go back and um, this plan on this Yasuni ITT, which it stands for Yasuni Intangible Tagere y Tarum Menane, which basically is this plan that he introduced, which was pretty revolutionary. Um, in 2008, which was a revolutionary environmental conservation plan where he introduced it. And it basically said, we will leave all of the oil that is in the ground in Yasuni National Park. We won't touch it if we can raise this amount of fund funding from international organizations and governments. And basically he, it was like a pledge, right? So I think the only two governments to actually go in on this were Germany and Spain pledged a bunch of money to Ecuador, but the oil reserves underneath Yasuni National Park are worth like multi-billions of dollars. And so when you, um, you know, when you juxtapose that against the ecotourism industry, it's really hard to kind of, as a politician, it's hard to have a popular, um, rhetoric when you say you know we're gonna not exploit oil which will basically completely single-handedly fund our economy and so it's really difficult um in that sense in ecuador conservation and uh anyways to finish up that thought about rafael correa he introduced this plan and a, a couple um different governments basically said yeah we'll we'll match it but other governments basically did more research into it and found that he was pretty corrupt. And then um, they broke ground in 2008 in, the, in Yasuni National Park to do oil, mm -hmm. oil exploitation. And uh, basically, essentially Ecuador used to be the best economy in South America up until around 2015 or so. And then it's really um, a lot of different reasons, but it's, taken a lot of turn to the worse and is actually somewhat violent these days and not to not to tourists at all but to people who live there and so a lot, he gets a lot of blame for that and he kind of was a lot of the face of like conservationism um and he by which is ironic because by the end he completely turned around and had these insanely neo-extractivist policies but essentially conservation in ecuador is very difficult because of that kind of connotation with it not being profitable. And so reversing that me message is really important. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and very difficult. Yes. Well, Tori, thank you. I mean, we know it's, it's not an easy solution and then there is no yeah. one single answer that will solve all this. But yeah. uh, thanks for bringing a lot of this to our attention. And we would love to have the information on the the organizations that you talked about yeah that I'll definitely get that put on our website and we can also put in the next newsletter if you send yeah us of course um and then for those of you who stuck around i've just got some 
bonus photos that didn't quite make the cut on the actual presentation from the Galapagos, which I didn't even get to, which is actually Ecuador's largest tourism draw. Um, and then I spent a, a while traveling through Brazil and some other places after I was in Ecuador. So I was just going to go through and show you some of the really interesting stuff I saw, like this jaguar. Um, this is in the Pantanal in wow. southern Brazil, which is the largest wetland in the world. And it's a really interesting kind of uh, revenue stream that they've set up there where they, you know, they have this this deep respect for jaguars in that region. And they've really set up this whole economy, taking people out and seeing them. So we got to see this jaguar really close and it really didn't care. We were on a boat and really not disturbing it at all. And so it's really interesting to see these different little pockets of ecotourism that have been set up in South America based on the incredible fauna. So got to see these guys um, really saw about seven jaguars in the Pantanal over two days. Um, and then this is a funny juxtaposition. This is one of the smallest <laughs> mammals in the Western hemisphere called a mouse opossum, which we came across in the Amazonian rainforest. And it's just a little bit different from this jaguar, but they're both mammals. So that's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, here is a huge manta ray that we were able to see. This is my friend Christian who took this photo and that is our one of the guys who's taking us all around the Galapagos. You can see how much smaller he is than this oceanic manta ray. He's, um, it was about 20 feet, had about 20 foot wingspan which was, it was absolutely crazy to be in the water with that thing. There's a really cool little guy I found while doing research called an O'Shaughnessy's Dwarf Iguana. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the application iNaturalist, but this was the 17th observation of this species, I believe. So kind of highlights how understudied the Choco is. There is Dario and Jimmy in the background um, being viciously attacked by this dwarf iguana. <laughs> um, here's a Galapagos mockingbird. Uh, interesting that these, hey, let me jump to this slide here. These guys, Darwin's ground finches, get a lot of the credit for evolution. Um, the theory of evolution by natural selection introduced by Darwin in the 1800s, but it was actually these guys, Galapagos mockingbirds, that inspired the idea um, because he took specimens from I think there's seven different species of mockingbirds on the Galapagos. And he took specimens of each of them and actually realized first that these were the ones that were slightly different from each other, which I've got another photo coming up of a different one that looks pretty much the same. <laughs> um, here's an American oyster catcher, which was running around with its chick. Unfortunately, I didn't get a good photo of it with its chick, but pretty attractive bird, which some of you might be familiar if you've spent any time on the Gulf Coast or even down in the Baja California or on the East Coast. But this is a um, Galapagos subspecies of American oyster catcher, which actually has evolved over the last couple hundred years. It's only started staying in the Galapagos. Um, they used to migrate there and now they just stay. So it's a speciation in progress. Here's a striated heron, which is also known as a lava heron on the Galapagos because it looks so different from the striated heron that we're used to. Well, that a lot of people are used to, but we're used to a very close relative called green heron. Um, and mostly those other ones are cool shades of green and chestnut, but these have actually evolved on the Galapagos to be this color where they blend in with the lava flows, um, this dark gray slate color. It's a cool photo of this blue-footed booby. It's a female. You can tell that by its iris size, actually. Um, you can see it has a smaller iris. Let me get that laser pointer back. It's a smaller iris and a larger pupil than this guy, which is the male, which is this female's mate. And they do this fun little dance and they are completely unafraid of humans. And so they actually uh, are a little antagonistic towards humans because they think that maybe um here's some potential competition for the female and they start doing this dance and showing off right in front of you which is pretty incredible if any of you had the fortune to visit the galapagos you can see him do this dance right in front of you um also right next to him are these great frigate bird colonies um 
these guys are the bullies of the ocean and they have this enormous red throat patch which you might say what the heck is that useful for well it's good old sexual selection so females prefer males who have a redder and a larger throat patch so this guy's inflated his throat patch and he's just sitting there i took this photo from about three feet away he's completely unbothered um really beautiful birds but then when you see them in the air stealing food from boobies and goals and stuff like that it's kind of hard to like them um here's the notorious medium ground finch um they are so similar to large and small ground finches that it's not even funny trying to discern them um otherwise a pretty unremarkable bird except for darwin of course making them famous um here's a swallowtailed gull which is an endemic to the galapagos and i don't know how many big lister birders we have here but one of these caused quite a stink about eight years ago showed up in washington and uh that you can imagine that's pretty rare because it's from the galapagos <laughs> and uh really interesting they are completely unafraid of people too and so their chicks are just hanging out on the ground um, and you can really see why the introduction of cats and rats and mice and other four-legged creatures that had never been on the Galapagos really uh, killed a lot of birds because these birds are completely unafraid of you. Here's the San Cristobal Mockingbird, which is actually the very first mockingbird that Darwin ever saw on the Galapagos and was his basis for comparing to all these other mockingbirds, which led to him looking at the finches, which led to him conceiving the idea of natural selection many years later. Um, here's a Galapagos penguin, which is the only penguin that exists north of the equator. And it's really quite an interesting bird because they're also completely unafraid of you. And if you snorkel, they will swim right up to you. And one actually swam right into me while I was snorkeling and then just looked up at me and went along his way. So they're pretty, uh, enigmatic of the Galapagos and unfortunately they're also very endangered. They're one of the most affected by climate change and intense weather fluctuation patterns. So they actually, what happens in the Galapagos is when there's an El Nino year, the water heats up so much that um, the, uh, uh, why am I forgetting the name of the um, Humboldt current, which flows up the western coast of South America and ends in the Galapagos, is essentially a food conveyor belt and dumps all this food into the Galapagos from deep water. And these guys rely on that. So when you have a really, really, really strong El Nino year and the water is really warm, that Humboldt current essentially stops flowing and starts flowing the opposite way. And so they have very little food. Um, and so during those El Nino years, you actually see a huge die off of birds in the Galapagos and especially these Galapagos penguins there, I think in 1976 was a huge El Nino year and their populations declined by 90% and there were only a couple hundred left in the world. So they're very vulnerable and, uh, unfortunately with climate change, it's not a great outlook for them. Um, here's a bird aptly named turquoise jay up in the cloud forest and another bird of the cloud forest uh, called an oil bird, which is one of the strangest birds in the world. They are um, huge caprimulga form birds, which is essentially a fancy way of saying a nighthawk. Um, and they live in caves and they live in these huge colonies. The largest colony of oil birds in the world is in a cave in Venezuela and there's about 27,000 birds that live in one cave, which is pretty crazy considering that these are about the size of a crow and they only eat fruit and they have such a hot, high fat diet. What the, well, what they'll do is they'll leave the cave at night and they'll go a couple hundred miles in search of palm fruit and they'll go into these palm trees and eat a bunch of palm fruit and then bring it back to the cave and feed their young. And it's such a high fat diet that their young actually have to lose weight before they're able to fly which is so ironic and they're so weird they are straight from the depths of hell they start you go into their cave and they start screaming bloody murder at you and flying around like these big wraiths they're really really something um and there's a little cave that was actually near where i did a bunch of research and so we got to go down and check them out and i was just enthralled and some of the other people i was with were not so enthralled 
Anyways, um, here's another uh, crimson rump toucanet, which was a bird. That's one of the photos we sent out holding. And this is one he's opened up his beak. Um, and this was at the same feeder where there was plate build mountain toucans. Really interesting, cool bird. Um, this is one of the most interesting birds in Ecuador, the black banded owl, the sunny cedro subspecies. This bird is known from one lodge in the entire world. And it's essentially an integrate between a black banded owl and a black and white owl. And these are, it's, it's like saying an integrate between a great horned owl and a great gray owl. And so this bird doesn't, it looks more like a black banded owl and it sounds more like a black and white owl and nobody's really figured out what the heck it is. So right now they just call it a black banded owl. Um, but it only exists from this one spot in Ecuador, this one lodge where it has been coming since 2000, 2012 to this bug light, and just picking off bugs off this bug light. And it's perhaps the most photographed owl in the world because it just sits there and allows you to take really nice pictures of it like this one. Um, and so definitely some more research is needed to be done on that bird to figure out what's going on with it. Here's just a couple photos from uh, Brazil. Uh, this is a cute little bird called a collared crescent chest. And this guy, crested black tire, which allowed me to get about three feet away from it and take some really nice photos. Um, and that is the extent of the photos I have here. I've got some more, but unfortunately, I just haven't had the time to go through a bunch of them. But thank you, everybody, for sticking around. And I hope you've enjoyed all these photos and all this information I about conservation in Ecuador and beyond in South America. Thank you very much, Shoria. We really appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks, um, Judy.